So let's understand more about this prefrontal cortex working memory system that plays such a critical role in our overall neural CPU. As we talked about in the previous chapter, the prefrontal cortex is really important for working memory, and this also translates into a really important contribution for cognitive control. And the key idea here is the notion of top-down biasing, uh, this idea that this kind of maintained state information in your frontal cortex is kind of shouting down at the rest of your brain saying, hey, do this, do this. This is what you got to be doing. Stay focused, stay on task. Next step in the program is, you know, add the ones. Next step in the program is add the tens and just kind of directing that attention and the focus and the overall step-by-step -step updating of what you're gonna do next in your cognitive program, we really think that prefrontal cortex is critical for kind of keeping you going on all those individual steps. And as we've said many times, the fact that this prefrontal cortex is asleep uh, when you're asleep and, and give rise to your inability to do any kind of meaningful problem solving cognition while you're asleep and and you know just have these kind of random disorganized patterns of thought because you're lacking that kind of top-down biasing effect so a classic task of this top-down biasing is known as the stroop test this is one of the most widely studied tasks in all of psychology and it's really it's really simple and it's very intuitive uh, you're just supposed to name the color that this, these letters are written in. Not saying the word, but, re, but naming the color. So here it's easy, red, green, uh, uh, green, right? You wanna say red, but you, you, you know you should say green and it takes that extra bit of effort from your prefrontal cortex to tell you, oh, wait a second, uh, you're gonna be tempted to say the word red, but you really need to focus on that color and say green. And of course it goes the other way here. You wanna say red here and not green. Um, and so what we can see in the data from typical people here is that when your job is to name that color, uh, when you get these kind of conflicting cases like that word a green printed in red ink or pixels, um, then you really experience a significant slowdown in, in a typical kind of psychology experiment. You know, having an effect size that's uh, a few hundred milliseconds or so is quite significant. And so people are really struggling to exert that top-down control, overcome what we call this prepotent or automatic bias towards reading. And because we all read so much, um, uh, our, our our initial instinct, our, our reaction, our, our reflex is to read the, the words. And we have this experience where we just can't help ourselves from reading like the stupid uh, text that's written on cereal boxes and stuff. It just, uh, you know, reading is completely automated. When your goal is instead to read the word, you can see there's no real effect of the conflict of only a very tiny effect of the conflict here. Uh, so really it's very asymmetric. So we have these other conditions here where uh, the, you have like the word purple written in purple ink, so it's congruent. And so you get a small speed up in the case of the congruent case for color naming relative to a neutral condition, which is just like a blob of color, right? So if I just have to say blue here, um, that's what I get for that. But in fact, if, I, if the word is congruent with the color, it's faster. But notice, interestingly, that there's still a little bit of a cost because you're focusing on the color, you're not focusing as much on naming the word. And so even though you could just read the word here, because you're trying to focus on the color, uh, that actually slows you down relative to reading words. So a very, very interesting pattern of data here. Uh, we have many computational models that explain how this kind of phenomenon works. These models take advantage of this key idea that your prefrontal cortex is sort of, you know, shouting, hey, name colors, name colors. And, and the back of your brain is like, well, we prefer reading. Maybe they prefer reading something like Facebook. You have to have this extra boost to support the weaker color naming pathway. This distinction between 
kind of what's automatic, natural, you know, reflexive, and what requires this kind of top-down extra control is known as kind of automatic versus controlled processing in the existing literature. And then Daniel Kahneman, who, who got the Nobel Prize, uh, decided to come up with uh, not a very creative names for these two different systems. System one being this kind of automatic uh, posterior cortical kind of natural, what you tend to do with the information. And then system two being this kind of more uh, effortful uh, uh, controlled processing system. So you will hear people talking about system one and system two, but I much prefer to talk about automatic versus controlled processing. The big problem with all of these theories is the idea that your prefrontal cortex has this ability to be this kind of executive, this commander telling you what to do. And this raises this fundamental problem of like, well, what allows that system to be so smart? How does it know? How does the prefrontal cortex know what to do in the first place? And so you have this homunculus problem. You have this problem that your explanation for where kind of intelligence and, and our kind of cognitive thinking abilities come from is just sort of like, well, we have something really smart, kind of like a person in our brain that happens to live in our frontal cortex and that thing's really smart. Well, how did that thing get so smart? Well, I guess if we follow our, our argument here, it must have a prefrontal cortex that has something really smart in it. And it's basically, you know, prefrontal cortex all the way down. Uh, this kind of infinite regress problem. You may have heard of the uh, classic example of turtles all the way down supporting the earth in space, according to this strange idea that the earth is supported by turtles. So uh, you have this infinite regress uh, problem. And we have been doing a lot of work in, in my lab looking at how uh, you can kind of take apart the ability of the frontal cortex and understand it in terms of a bunch of different additional components. So in our, in our thinking, you can kind of look at especially the effects of learning to understand where that intelligence comes from without this kind of infinite regress, regress problem. And the learning, as we talked about previously, comes from dopamine uh, and this phasic uh, signals indicating when, when things go better than expected or worse than expected. And we think about that dopamine as playing this kind of critic role relative to uh, the basal ganglia, which we talked about is very strongly modulated by the dopamine. And the basal ganglia, it turns out, as we know, is very strongly interconnected with the frontal cortex and we can describe that relationship as, as in terms of gating. So the basal ganglia is essentially telling the frontal cortex when some good cognitive action is uh, there and should be taken versus, again, that kind of no-go pathway saying, no, this is not a good next step to take. And so that ability to sequence from one cognitive step to the next, we think depends critically on the basal ganglia interacting with the frontal cortex. So it's not really just the frontal cortex. It's the basal ganglia, frontal cortex, dopamine system, all being trained up through experience to figure out what are the right kinds of cognitive steps to take in a given situation that's going to lead to success. And in fact, all of this stuff really has to somehow get turned into a goal-driven, motivated, kind of ends-focused teleological kind of system that, that really drives uh, cognitive steps towards achieving a particular goal. And frankly, we don't quite understand all of how that works, but we know these are the key elements and, and how these elements can work at a, at a basic level, but there's still a lot of problems that need to be solved to understand exactly how all this learning results in this uh, kind of Turing machine-like capability that we think exists in the overall kind of emergent behavior of the overall system.